It's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, who also happens to be the co-organizer of this seminar, Robert Dougherty Bliss, who will talk about automatic inverse continuous fraction calculators. Robert. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Z, for the very warm welcome and the invitation to speak about the paper that we wrote together at the seminar that we both run. It means <laughs> a lot. So something I should mention that was pointed out to me uh, right before we started, is that I didn't write, I was very careless, I did not write joint with the, the famous Theron Zalberger. So I'm sorry about that. That's, that's important to note before we get any further in the talk. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about continued fractions. And this is based on a paper that Dr. Z and I wrote together. And that paper is dedicated to the memory of one Richard Askey. And it, it seems inappropriate to not mention something about him before we go on. So I'll take just a, a few minutes to do that. So Richard Askey was a, a mathematician who passed away just last year. And he was well known for his work in special functions and especially his, his proselytization of special functions. Uh, by special functions, I mean things like orthogonal polynomials, hypergeometric functions, Bessel functions. Uh, these were things that at some point in time throughout history, all the greats have studied at some point. That's why they're named special. They were useful in solving a problem. But after some amount of time, the study of special functions seemed to fall out of favor with the bulk of the community. Uh, and not many people were using them or were too familiar with them. And Richard Askey was one of the people that pointed this out and said that this was a real shame. There's a nice quote here from his, his book, Orthogonal Polynomials and Special Functions, about how uh, reluctant people were generally to read things that involved any sort of complicated special functions. Uh, and he was one of, the, one of the people that said that we should really rectify that. And as an example, I have a brief story from, his, uh, from the preface of that book that he tells, which is, is an example of how uh, overlooking special functions led us to overlook some important results, or at least some interesting results. So the result we're talking about is about Hankel matrices. And they're matrices defined by some formula here, some additive thing. Uh, I want to point out a special case, though, that's probably more familiar to most people. Let's see how this looks. OK. So a special case that some people might see here is that uh, Hilbert matrices are Hankel matrices. So a Hilbert matrix is a matrix of the form the i jth entry is just the reciprocal, the sum of the indices. So a Hilbert matrix might look like this. One, one half, one half, one third. Now, so a Hilbert matrix is just a, a special case of this more general Hankel matrices where the entries are given as moments of some distribution function that we could worry about some other time. And the problem that was in question is, can you find the smallest eigenvalue of a given Hankel matrix? And not exactly, There's, it's still a little too complicated, but can you at least figure it out asymptotically as the size of the matrix grows bigger and bigger? So it, it turns out that the answer is yes. And the smallest eigenvalue, it turns out, is asymptotic to this quantity here, something like the square root of the order of the matrix divided by some constant raised to the nth power. And this was first uh, proven by Seggio back in 1936. And no one noticed it. <laughs> for, for 30 years, it was kind of forgotten. And then uh, generating function guru Herbert Wilf, the late Herbert Wilf, came along 30 years later in 1966 and proved the exact same thing. And Richard Askey points out that this does happen from time to time. Someone will prove something and then it gets forgotten to history and someone else comes along and proves it. But Richard Askey points out that Seggio, in his proof, used Legendre polynomials and various properties about them. So probably what happened is people saw the paper, read it, and they went, ah, I don't know about this one, and moved along to the next paper. And then uh, Wilf came along and did almost the exact same proof 30 years later. So this is just a, an example of how maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to special functions, like Richard Askey told us to all those years ago. So, so this, this assumes that CN has the special form Yes, it assumes that CN has this form here. Which for any, is, any measure alpha? For any measure alpha, yeah. It, it has some technical restrictions on it. OK. But uh, for the most part, most distributions that you could write down alpha, yes. So just to demonstrate how it arises here. In particular, 
is applied to the Hilbert matrix? Yeah, so in particular, if you were to take d alpha to be one, or alpha is uh, x on the interval zero to one, then you get that cn is this integral here, uh, which is one over n <laughs> plus one. And that's how you recover the Hilbert matrix formula. Is that related to the fact that the Hilbert matrix is a favorite example of in numerical analysis for an unstable matrix that is very dangerous to invert? That's a good question. I don't know in general if, if all Hunkel matrices are dangerous to invert, but you're right that uh, Hilbert matrices, the reason I picked them is they're so familiar as something that's dangerous to just plug into a computer in the linear algebra class if you're not careful. And what's the sigma in the denominator? Is that the variance or something? It's some constant that you can find that only depends on, I think maybe, ooh, I forget what the order of the constants is, but it's some constant that's in the, uh, that is independent of n. That uh -huh. is, has some complicated expression in terms of alpha, I think. Yes. And what exactly is n in the, in the asymptotic formula? n is the size of the matrix, the order of the matrix. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions about the great work of Richard Askey pointing things out to us? Okay, well, again, thank you to Richard Askey for your dedicated work in popularizing special functions. So to get to the topic of our talk today, we're going to talk about a particular class of special functions called continued fractions. These should be familiar to most people, but let's just give a quick rundown of what they look like. So continued fractions are expressions of this form here, these nested fractions, where you can specify any two sequences, a, a numerator sequence, these Bs, and a denominator sequence, these As, like that. Um, traditionally, they would be integers, uh, positive integers, negative integers, anything like that. But in general, they could really be whatever you want. As long as they're elements from some field, then the fractions all make sense. The expression could be finite, it could stop at some point, or it could be infinite, in which case it's interpreted as a limit. The one case that everyone is familiar with, at least in number theory, it's the most interesting case, is when the BNs are identically equal to one, in which case we call these continued fractions simple, and we also need that the ANs are integers. And it turns out that there's a pretty simple way, hence the name, a simple way to compute simple continued fraction expansions. So every real number has a continued fraction expansion of this form, and it's, it's pretty easy to work out. So if you take any real at all, you can write it as the floor, so you round down, plus the reciprocal of some other real number, which is implicitly defined by this equation then you can repeat this and do it for the reciprocal that you got and you get a, another number and you can carry on in this way as long as it takes and then you'll be able to write things like this of x plus one over the floor of x2 plus one over the floor of x3 and so on and so forth so it turns out to be very easy to work out simple continued fractions and it doesn't depend on writing like decimal numbers are in base 10. This is universal. This is universal. In fact, that's one of the nice properties of simple continued fractions is that they are unique, it turns out. So that procedure I just mentioned is easy enough to figure out and write down. And it generates a simple continued fraction, but it also turns out to be a unique continued fraction. So there's no other way to do it. There's no other sequence of integers that would give you that equality with ones in the numerator. And another nice property about them is that uh, you have a real number. Every real is rational if and only if it has a, a, a finite continued fraction expansion. It's pretty obvious that it's rational if it has a finite expansion. The other way is not so obvious, that you're irrational if you have an infinite one. Uh, so if you ever wanted to prove that something was irrational... Yeah, how about, sorry to interrupt, uh, sure. David Molnar, Molnar asking the chat whether it is irrational. If you're talking about irrational numbers? So okay. which number? Hey, David? Irrational numbers have unique expressions. Oh, good. Uh, okay, good. I, I, sh I, should say, I should say one thing. So yeah. rational numbers 
have an almost unique continued fraction expansion. Almost you add unique. one term at the end or remove one term. But they're, thank you, David. They are essentially unique. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good point. Now, so one plan of attack, if you wanted to prove that a number was irrational, is you write down its continued fraction expansion, and then you just somehow prove that it's, it'll never stop. That process I just showed you will go on forever. So if, say if you wanted to prove that pi was irrational, all you have to do is show that this sequence of numbers, which is shorthand for 3 plus 7 over 15, oh, excuse me, 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15, and so on, just prove that that list of numbers never ends. Shouldn't be too hard, right? <laughs> Except that it's very hard, it turns out. So good luck. We know that pi is irrational for other reasons. Uh, but it, this is one way that you could do it. But I uh, don't want to talk so much about simple continued fractions. That's more of a, a number theoretical question. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about general continued fractions, where the numerators are allowed to vary and be different things. And we don't care so much if things are integers. Uh, maybe we will eventually. But we're, we're going to let them be anything, and we'll work on that. And the big difference between general continued fractions and simple continued fractions is that we don't actually know anything about general continued fractions. They aren't unique. Uh, it's, there's not a good process for generating them. It's not like with simple, where there's a quick algorithm you can write down. How do you find them? It's, I don't know. You just plug in things and see what works. And even worse, you don't know anything about irrationality when it comes to uh, infinite general continued fractions. So here's, here's an identity. We'll stick with blue. Why not? This is a, a continued fraction identity that you can just believe me, I guess. It, it, it comes from a well-known formula called Euler's continued fraction. But this is an infinite general continued fraction of 2. And last I checked, 2 was rational. So there's no way to say that infinite continued fractions in the general case imply irrationality. But they're, they're what we're going to talk about anyway. We're going to talk about them rather than the simple ones. And the reason for that is, is that not everything is going to be so easy to find. If you're using simple continued fractions, you really only have you know, this one sequence to deal with. But maybe with general continued fractions, when you're trying to find good continued fractions for whatever reason, you can broaden out your search space and look at more complicated things and maybe see what you're looking for easier than just staring at one sequence of integers forever and hoping you can prove something about them. So we're going to try and broaden up our search space a little bit to look at more complicated things. Now, we should take a second, uh, a complete aside, and talk about inverse calculators, the maybe first or second part of the title for the talk. So what is an inverse calculator? Well, it is a, a term that I may have just invented. I don't know what the formal name is. It's kind of, it's just the inverse to a problem that we're all familiar with. So easy problems are someone gives you a formula or an equation and says, what are the solutions to this equation? What are the roots of this function? Something like that. Find the zeros of this, the zeros of a polynomial, the zeros of a trigonometric function. Uh, those are relatively easy in comparison to the reverse problem, where the reverse problem is I give you a number, a value, something, and you tell me all the equations that it might satisfy. This is a, a very hard problem because it's not even a well-posed problem. It doesn't even exactly make sense. What are all the f that you're looking for? And this is the, the inverse. So this is the, the forward direction. And this is the inverse direction where you're given a value and trying to find the equation backwards. And the reason that we care about that is sometimes at least when you're working experimentally, you can try and approximate some value, but you have no idea what that value is exactly. And you're just trying to find any way to get a hold of it. And so sometimes you can plug it into an inverse calculator and it'll say, maybe it's the root of this equation. Maybe it's the root of this polynomial. Maybe it satisfies some weird funky identity and you can study it that way. So it's really useful when you just have nothing else to go on. And a very famous example of this is the PSLQ algorithm that Ferguson and Bailey described in the 80s or 90s. I can't remember now. I didn't write the date down, but certainly before the century. Now, what the PSLQ algorithm does is it finds integer relationships between real numbers. 
So you give it a list of reels. Uh, maybe we only need one to get the idea across. Oh, an X would be more appropriate. And it's going to try and produce uh, a list of suitable integers such that this linear combination is zero. So this is the AKs are integers and the XKs are just arbitrary reals. This might not seem too terribly interesting if you're not excited about these kinds of automatic inverse calculations. So maybe let me pitch you an example why it would be cool. So say that you wanted to guess if a certain number was algebraic. If you wanted to know if it was the root of an integer polynomial, then what you could do is you could plug in, oh, PS, LQ. You could plug in, say something like this, give the PSLQ algorithm the list one X and X squared and say, can you find- Thomas, uh, Charlie, uh, ask, how are the real numbers represented? Ah, Charlie, that's a, that's a great question. So if I remember internally, but practically, whenever you feed it to the algorithm, you're gonna need to give it some kind of floating point approximation. So uh, something uh, numerically, usually not exactly. It's, if I remember correctly, the algorithm is some fancy linear algebra. See, was there a follow-up? Charlie says, okay. So if you wanna guess if a number is algebraic, then you can plug it into the PSLQ algorithm. And uh, let's say, for example, what if we plugged in the golden ratio, everyone's favorite algebraic number for some reason. So if we didn't know what it was, we only had a numerical approximation. If you do this with enough decimal digits, it will spit out the list one, one minus one, which is, I've already written X, I guess I'll stick with X. V is of course normally what you write the golden ratio with. So this means that it conjectures that the golden ratio, which you only gave it to it numerically, satisfies this equation. Which if you didn't know what number you were working with is not obvious, but of course we know that the golden ratio is the unique positive number that satisfies this. So uh, the PSLQ algorithm can uh, discover that the golden ratio is algebraic with no foreknowledge of the golden ratio at all, without knowing what it is exactly, just a good numerical approximation. So this is one reason that you might care about inverse calculators. Now, we've talked about continued fractions and inverse calculators, and those seem completely unrelated to one another. So why did I talk about continued fractions on the one hand and then inverse calculators on, on the other? Because what I really want to talk to you about is continued fraction inverse calculators. I want to put the two things together and talk about them at once. So some months ago, I think at the beginning of the year, maybe just before quarantine, in fact. Uh, yeah, Rob, let me interrupt. Sure. In fairness, fairness to Lemstra, Lemstra and Lovash is a competition, compared another algorithm that does the same thing that is also often used, the LLL algorithm. Ah, uh, is the PSLQ algorithm? Yeah, there's another, it's two different algorithms that do more or less the same thing, but it's also the LLL does the same thing. And That's, who was this again? Uh, Lens Lenstra, Lenstra and Lovash. Ah, uh, let's see, oh, of course. Our I won't bother to ask you how to spell their names. It's obvious then, isn't it? It's LLL. Thank you. And it's very widely used, of course. Um, and it's the, important in cryptography, especially code breaking, oh, the, na the knapsack problem. And it does the same thing. It defines integer relations. Yes. OK, thank you for that note. That'd be very useful. Another fun thing to go play with later. Now, uh, back to it, yes. We were. Um, so uh, Dr. Z and I were contacted a, a few months ago by some computer scientists uh, working in Israel. And they were working on kind of uh, this numerical inverse problem that I've been talking about. So it was the same kind of thing where they started this project, they called it the 
Ramanujan machine, a very fancy name. I didn't come up with it. But what it does is you give it a, a constant, it's like the, you gave the PSLQ algorithm, and it tries to find general continued fractions that might converge to that constant. So rather than uh, trying to evaluate continued fractions, it goes in reverse, and it tries to, find, tries to fit numerically continued fractions to it. So there are, I just grabbed two examples here. Uh, this example on the left is a general continued fraction expansion for essentially zeta 2. It's pi squared, but there's a zeta 2 in there if you fish around enough. And then over here on the right is a general continued fraction expansion for zeta of 3 with some constants, but it's basically zeta 3. Now, uh, what they were doing is uh, they wrote this and they looked at it as kind of this numerical problem and they were very excited to try all their fancy computer science techniques. How can you search this enormous space of general continued fractions and find promising results in them? But uh, of course their programs couldn't automatically prove them. It couldn't, uh, it couldn't do anything with them other than say, hey, this might be true. It's a pretty good approximation. So they had a list of a few hundred or maybe, I don't know how many they actually had, what they published was a few hundred different identities that might be true. And they were asking for help proving some of the trickier ones. They had already proven a, a good chunk of them, uh, gotten help from people online or from people nearby. And finally, they reached out to us to see what we had to say about it. Asked if we would take a look. So we took a look. So. Uh, a lot of the conjectures they have uh, turn out to be true. And some of them are not like terribly original or exciting. Some of them turn out to be just special cases of things that we knew before, you know, maybe continued fractions that Euler knew after some rearranging or something like that. But, but for the most part, they all seem to be right. And we could prove some of the trickier ones that they weren't able to, but there were still some other ones that were kind of, a, a, we, we, didn't, we ran into a brick wall. We couldn't figure them out. And the exciting thing is that some of these converge pretty quickly, actually. So here, uh, these, are, these are a bunch of conjectures they have for uh, the real G. G is Catalan's constant. I have enough room to write this. So uh, this is a real defined by a certain series that's not terribly important. But the problem with Catalan's constant is it's been around for a long time. And no one knows if it's rational or irrational. Um, we know, you know, that it equals some certain series. I know. It's irrational for sure. Nobody knows how to prove it. But of course it's irrational. Uh, of course. Okay. So we're almost certain that it's irrational because why would it be irrational? It doesn't make any sense for just a random real number you pick out to be irrational. But we don't have a proof. Oh, no. We're not almost sure. We're absolutely <laughs> sure it's irrational. We are... Absolutely sure the G is irrational. Only we, we don't have a proof of that. We don't, no one's figured out a way to write it down and prove it. Yeah, that's fair. So it would be interesting to play the game of proof and try and find a, a proof that G is irrational. Um, and for that purpose, it would be useful to find very quickly converging continued fractions. And why is that? So the reason I don't think they're so upfront about it on their website and in their paper, the Ramanujan machine people, but they do, uh, they do mention it. Um, one sort of goal they have in the back of their mind is if they could find continued fractions that converge quickly enough to a real, they might be able to prove that that real was irrational. And the reason for that comes from, from this fact. So if you fix a real, some, some real X, if there are infinitely many integers a n b n such that uh, they are a, a nice approximation in the following sense uh, let's see what I want to say one over b n one plus delta now that should be a delta, but instead it looks like a delta that's fallen on its side. That's a little better. So if you can find a sequence of integers, or I mean, basically rationals, that nicely approximate x in, in this sense, this very specific sense, 
related to the denominators of your rational approximation, then it turns out that X is irrational. So all you have to do, or one way, one thing you could do, is find a really fast rational approximation to uh, a real X, and that might be able to prove, after you do some checking and some, some, some serious work, you might be able to prove... Robert, in the chat, Charlie asked uh, for some data. Charlie, can you clarify? Uh, uh, yeah, what's the... What do you mean by this delta? Is it... All, all delta greater than zero or some delta greater than zero? For some delta greater than zero. Thank you, Charlie. It exists, the delta bigger than zero. Yes, that, that, that's a good point though. All you have to do is find one delta that works, but this is, that doesn't make your life much easier, really. It, it's still a pretty hard problem to do. But if you could find such a sequence and such a delta, and implicitly here, uh, such a constant, then you would get that X is irrational. So this is one popular way, one, one kind of trick to try and prove that something's irrational. And in a sense, it's kind of like the only way that we have to prove that things are irrational. The, the well-known classical cases like the square root of two that have purely algebraic proofs seem kind of easy by comparison. Uh, all the complicated things that we know that are irrational all come from nice approximations and things like this. At least in, that I've seen so far. Maybe I'm, I'm no expert in number theory, of course. So uh, the reason that simple continued fractions are nice is simple continued fractions guarantee that this happens. The approximations that you get work out to be just good enough to prove that something is irrational. For a general continued fraction, you aren't guaranteed that that will happen, but it could happen. You just don't know where to look. With, with the simple continued fraction, it's, it's clear where you look. There's only one place to look. So this is why Maybe not entirely why, but this is one reason the Ramanujan machine people are interested uh, in. Robert, let me uh, make it more precise. Uh, it has to be an infinite continued fraction that is bounded. Uh, the, the terms must be bounded uh, for the... And also, as far as proving, a priori don't know whether it's infinite or not. Like, a priori, a C can have a finite continued fraction. Of course, right. But this is, uh, this is one motivation that why we are looking at these. This is one example, but also because the identities look pretty cool. That's the other reason. So, all right. So this is, this is why we're looking so hard at these. So let's, let's try and say what we did here. Um, so what happens is we looked at some conjectures the Ramanujan machine people had, and we tried to find ways to prove them. And we didn't really do anything that complicated, honestly. Uh, we sat down and spent, I don't know, a few hours trying to remember facts about continued fractions and some recurrences that come out, and we, we found a technique to prove them. So, uh, oh, I've got some slightly confusing notation here. It should be P of N, not sub N, but it, hopefully it's clear. I'll actually erase it because I think that's even less clear. So it turns out from the, the theory of continued fractions that there is an easier way to compute them than by actually going through all the arithmetic of the nested fraction. So you can write down sequences, P sub n and Q sub n, that are defined by a certain recurrence, these recurrences right here, and they're actually the same recurrence, they just have different initial conditions. And then it turns out if you take your continued fraction and you chop it off at some point, you just look at the finite one, then it equals the ratio of these two sequences. So our big insight, our technique to prove these was step one, write the recurrences. Step two, solve the recurrences. Step three, try and compute the limit of the ratio. And if you're lucky, it'll just work out. So let's see a good example of this to show you sort of how we actually did the work. So here is uh, one example. Oh, there's uh, the answer. Don't look at the answer. It's a secret. Stop looking. Okay, good. I'll, I'll erase that in a moment. Now, uh, so the example we're looking at here is we've got 
a continued fraction expansion, and we're going to pretend that it's some conjecture that we were given, and we're going to see if we can prove that it's true. So uh, step one is identify the sequences. So the denominator sequence, the A's, seems to be N, and the numerator sequence seems to be the B's, seems to be N plus one. So if we take the recurrences from the previous slide, I won't bother to write them down, they're kind of messy, and we try and solve them, uh, we can see what happens. And in fact, this recurrence was simple enough that Maple can just solve it for us. So here is a terminal printout of exactly that, just asking Maple's R solve command, hey, here's a recurrence, could you solve it for us? And it turns out that it can in terms of the incomplete gamma functions in, in both cases, which is, can be written in a certain nicer way to verify, but it can just spit the answer out for us. And we can even do the last step in Maple too, because they were so simple, we can say, well, would you mind just dividing PN by QN and telling us what the asymptotics are as N goes to infinity? And it spits out, okay, well, when you do that, here are the asymptotics you're looking for. So if you then simplify that, because Maple was a little too dumb to do the divisions for you and make everything look nice, uh, this technique has proven to us with basically no human input on our part that this continued fraction expansion here equals E minus one. And the nice thing is that once you've figured out this approach, this technique here, you just wrap this in a function and then you can put in any sequence you want and see what comes out. So what we did after this is we took some of the conjectures that they did that we thought were particularly interesting. I guess I don't need to erase those. And we looked to see if uh, small modifications would still result in nice formulas. So maybe we take one of these sequences and maybe we add in something like a, oh, like a plus one there, or maybe we put a, a two there just to see what would happen, things like that. Uh, and that is what we'll talk about on the next slide here. So we just took those few lines that we wrote and we wrote a helper package to make things a little bit easier to, and find ways to experiment with them. And this is an example of the kind of work that we did while we were trying to figure things out. So we thought that maybe if you just have slight modifications, maybe you can work out some kind of pattern here. And then maybe you can generalize the specific continued fractions to infinite families, which is kind of nifty because the Ramanujan machine can only do specific continued fractions. It's not clever enough to figure out that it could generalize. Uh, to do that, maybe you need a tiny bit of human insight, but only a tiny bit, I promise. So here's something like what you know, we would do some nights. We would compute some of these continued fractions. So these are, the A's are N plus K and the B's are minus N. And this is a sub K perhaps, K is allowed to vary. And here I compute this from K one to six. And these are the resulting continued fractions that we get out of that. These are what they equal. So if you look at these, some, some patterns start to jump out to you. So the numerator always looks like it's E. The denominator looks like it's, it looks like we have some sequence here minus maybe some other sequence there. Two obviously and nice sequences. You hope obviously nice sequences, right? Well, you, can, you can see them, yeah. Of course, so it looks like DN is maybe in factorial shifted or something. Uh, the DNs are, it looks like, let's start here, perhaps 2, 6, 24, 120. So it sure looks like the factorials there. The CNs are maybe not so nice. I don't run the OAIS though, so maybe they are nice. And I'm, I'm well, they are them. nice. <laughs> so if we look here, there's, well, let's, let's, let's start it from here, perhaps. We have 1, 2, 9, 44, and this is not immediately obvious to me what it is, but maybe there's something there. Maybe we just haven't computed enough terms. So if we go to the next slide, I've computed some more terms. So now this is just the, 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 the other sequence here, the coefficient on the E in the denominator. 
So one, probably a zero. One, two, nine, forty. It's either derangement or ballot numbers, right? Yes. So it, it turns out that the D in sequence is, uh, I think I picked the right notation. Oh, I think I may have called the C. Well, it doesn't matter now. It turns out that these numbers are the derangement numbers, the 166th entry in the OEIS. So at the risk of confusing you, I'll call them D again, is the nth derangement number. And this is the number of permutations on n elements with no fixed points. And so when I saw this, I got kind of excited. I, I was like, what? Why? That doesn't make any sense. Why are the derangement numbers popping up? And I spent a good chunk of time trying to understand maybe there's some combinatorial interpretation. Maybe I can somehow sneak in permutation somewhere. I, I couldn't do it. I'm, maybe I'm just not clever enough to find it, but uh, I think it turns out the dream one, one over E, of course. One over E. So the probability of getting your hat back at a from the coat check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the derangement numbers have a, a connection and probability and things like that. I, I won't go into it, but it makes sense a little bit why they pop up after we figured out what the formula actually was. So uh, this here is this notation from our paper is shorthand for a of n is n plus k and b of n is a times n. And I realize I've used a twice, but that's okay. I think you'll, you'll survive. So uh, it turns out that using some special functions as uh, appropriate for our dedication to Richard Askey in the beginning and some small results from generating functions, uh, you can prove this identity. So you can write down the general recurrence for this uh, and do some finagling and go reach for some results from differential equations and then do some asymptotic analysis. And uh, this ends up falling out, this very pretty neat formula, which now that we're looking at, it doesn't really seem to have anything to do at all with the derangement numbers, but how they come in, at least one thing that's nice to explain here is let's see if I can remember how this works now. So Ram, Ramanujan did this about a hundred years ago, you know. Yes, so it, it's nice to be able to re-derive some of these results without having to think about them too hard. So let's see, what is, if we set a equal to minus one and we switch K. Is this particular identity due to Ramanujan? Probably. Oh, okay. I mean, it, uh, yeah. Well, we did it, other things, but maybe we got scooped. Uh, Robert, do you know? Uh, in our paper, did we mention Ramanujan? I don't know if, if this particular result is due to Ramanujan, but he worked out many continued fractions. It's possible that, uh, as did Euler and lots of people and Gauss, and it, it's possible that if you look at one of their nice identities and you make the right substitutions, that this would fall out. Well, the thing in parentheses in the denominator, the, the, um, that's in all the classical books on analysis with a reference to Ramanujan. Copson's book is the one I studied it in and a, mil a million years ago. This thing, maybe we should give a reference. Of yeah. course, only a very special case, what we did, but it's nice to relate it to Ramanujan. Right, this was one of the, we found a few infinite families, but it's worth pointing out here that this is, of course, the, the difference between the partial sums of E and e itself. So that's why you would see that pop up in time to, from time to time. But if you, if you end up plugging A equals minus one, uh, the denominator becomes, what do I want to say here? So if you look at just, put it like this, D is K now. D is just this quantity here. If you do this, then the dis distributing the factorial, I'm just gonna look at the sum to try and explain that. Minus one to the S over S factorial. 
So this turns out to be equal to, if I have it right, uh, k minus one factorial over e. And this means closest integer to. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the k minus one derangement number. Let's see, maybe I can write this instead, since I'm running out of room, d k minus one. So that's how the derangement numbers pop up. It's actually not quite the nice combinatorial thing I was hoping for, or even the nice probabilistic thing I was hoping for. It was just a, a summation identity, basically, at the end of the day. So uh, one thing uh, worth pointing out is that our, our techniques weren't anything that fancy or that complicated. As Neil mentioned earlier, some of it had probably already been done before by people you know, earlier than us and smarter than us. But I think the, the clever thing, or the, the fun thing anyway, is that we were able to get a lot of these results really without that much work or any foresight. Um, for a lot of these, we could have, I think, automated the entire process. So what we did is we you know, computed a bunch of particular cases and then thought, oh, that probably generalizes. And then we sat down and tried to generalize them. But most of the time, after the fact, when we look back on it, we realized we really thought too hard about this. It probably could have been done all by a computer. It just needed to know to you know, do the right thing, do the asymptotic analysis, just teach it where to look for. So if anyone were particularly good at doing asymptotic analysis with generating functions, for instance, I think they could have done uh, that family I just showed you entirely with no human input, just someone to type in the commands to their computer algebra system. Um, so that would be worth doing, I think, in a, a better way to get more and more families, because maybe eventually at some point, the identities that we get are going to be too big and too complicated to work out by hand. So it would be nice to have a completely automated approach rather than a semi-automated approach where we get lazy and we don't know how to do it. Uh, just wrapping up here now, we're, we've reached the end. Um, not all of our continued fractions are so new. The ones that we found, I only showed uh, one family. Uh, we found a few of them, I think three altogether. Uh, there were plenty of others that we could have written down, but the, we just wrote down the three that we thought were more interesting. Um, not all of them were anything new. Some of them ended up being through some finagling, some special cases of things that other people had done before. But it was interesting to find them without any work on our part or any sophisticated continued fraction expansion knowledge. We didn't have to go through, you know, Wall's famous text on continued fractions, for example. Um, and it might be the case that the continued fractions that we're looking for, those that converge quick enough to prove irrationality or something like that, uh, maybe they're just hard to find in general. And so maybe they're not the ones that you would be able to sit down and just write down by hand, you know, just be, have the foresight to do that. Um, it, sort of a famous example, of course, is Roger Opery's proof that zeta of three is irrational, um, where he wrote down these just marvelous sequences that he pulled out of his hat from nowhere and just made some claims that ended up being true. Uh, the reason that it took so long for anyone to do it is because the sequences really are pretty astounding when you look at them and you have to wonder how we came up with them. So anything that we can do to reduce the level of astounding insight that we need and lucky guessing to find nice approximations would be good. And maybe playing around with automatic proofs of continued fraction is a, a step in the right direction for that. Uh, Robert, uh, in the chat, uh... A team of teacher ask a question. A team, you want to say it yourself? Yes, I see the question. I, I can say the question. Okay, so the question is, are there some identities that are still conjectured? If so, what's an example of a particularly interesting one? So yes, they have lots of identities that are still conjectured. Um, the one, a lot of the ones that I've mentioned here have been done, but let's see if I could go back and show you I may have to go one at a time. For example, these, all of these involving Catalan's constant, I, I don't think they're true. Uh, it's not, not, they're not true. I don't think anyone's proven them. Um, numerically, they seem pretty accurate, but I have no idea if they're true. Uh, I haven't thought that terribly hard about them, but 
Are they supposed to be independent or are they, if you prove one, do you prove them all? I don't think that they know that, if that's true or not. Um, I would assume there's lots of uh, ways that continued fractions can be related to one another. Uh, transformation identities and things like that. And some of that could also be worked out automatically maybe. But I don't think they know. It seems unlikely that they're all independent. They're, they have a list of 40 or 50 conjectures and it seems like surely they must be related to one another somehow. But I don't think anyone has a, a good sense of how to relate them yet. These are not, uh, the Ramanujan people and, and Dr. Z and I for that matter are not fancy number theorists. So we're not always so good at finding the, the connections between the identities. But uh, if you want to go play with our maple package, it's available here on this site, which I assume you won't copy from this slide. But when we put the slides up, you're welcome to go there and download it and take a look at it. But that's all that I have to say. Does anyone have any questions for me? First, let's thank the speaker. I, I found the Ramanujan, I found some, some Ramanujan references. Yeah, very interesting. So this uh, ends it for much. Uh, any questions, uh, Neil, you have? So we appreciate having the exact reference. Maybe we should add it. Uh, Robert, in our paper, did we reference Ramanujan? I don't think we reference Ramanujan explicitly, uh, although it's kind of hard maybe to reference him explicitly because so much of what he did wasn't published. All right. Well, if Neil has a specific reference, it'd be helpful. Yeah, I have, Neil, do you have something? Yeah, sure. I, um, I may have a, a comment. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look into the book uh, Gödel Escherbach by Dag Hofstadter, there is, of course, talk about Ramanujan, and there is also a continued fraction, which uh, is listed under one of Ramanujan's strange Indian melodies. So I remember that because uh, uh, I was in awe when I saw that. No? So, and uh, so that's when I started playing myself with a few continued fractions. And uh, so you may want to look up that particular continued fraction and see uh, whether you can actually prove it. I was really amazed how he came up with that thing. No? We should look at it. I have the book, my kitchen. Look at yeah, it. I, would, I would write the title, but I, I'm too worried I'm, I'd embarrass myself by not knowing how to spell Escher. So, Gertel Escher Bach, yes. <laughs> And you look for one of uh, Ramanujan's strange Indian melodies. There's a picture in there with that uh, continued fraction. Okay, thank you. Uh, but Tim, uh, Timothy Chow uh, believes that it doesn't have integers. It's a different one. Hmm? Uh, according to the chat by Tim Chow, uh, it doesn't have integers. Uh, maybe it has rationals in it, but that would still be an interesting identity, I think. Yeah. Maybe not a number theoretic one, but it, it could be I interesting. I remember it from top of my head now, but uh, the, the final result has uh, uh, definitely pi and square root of five or something like that in there. Hmm. And uh, so I was amazed how one could possibly prove something like that by the time of my knowledge, I was just a credit student. Hmm. <clears throat> and Neil, you said that you had maybe a reference to something? I have several references. I'll Xerox the page from Copson and send it to you. Okay. There's, there's um, the one reference is from the PLMS, which is the Proceedings of the London Math Society for 1929. And there's one from the JLMS, which is the Journal of the London Math Society from 1928 by the look of it. And there's also something in the Canadian Math Bulletin from 1960 that's related to this. It has to do with the difference between that sum where you sum the first uh, k to the n of a factorial k from one to n and you compare it with e to the n. The error, the difference. This, I mean, this is, would be, this would be nice to know about then. Uh, of course, this difference comes up all the time in analysis, so. Right. This was mentioning, thank you. Be nice to be scored, but I'm <laughs> Are there any other questions from the audience? Well, let's thank Robert again. Thank you. Thank you for coming. This ends. Thanks. This. Thank, you. thank you very much. So Robert, please end the meeting. Sure. Thank you. Right. Good seeing everyone. See you next week for our next speaker. Thank you very much.
ठीक है